Hello, BookTube. We're going to continue with uh, this apparently endless library tour <laughs> that seems to fascinate you all so much. Uh, and we are at the fifth bookshelf of the tall West Wall bookcase. Uh, and we'll once again start with the transverse books, the first of which is something we've seen on this channel before, proving, uh, illustrating once again, the thing that I've said a few times before now, which is that there is uh, slow but steady Everglades-like sump pump action of new books finding their way into this room, which is uh, more or less my main permanent collection. Uh, uh, certainly a favorites. And the, that's this. Uh, How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog, which is about a scientific experiment uh, in Siberia where uh, a group of eugenicists tried to domesticate wild foxes, uh, a group of wild foxes, to see and to see what it would take to make them tame. Not just tamed, but tame. To make them a, a domestic species of dog. Uh, and they found all sorts of surprises. So surprise number one is that it doesn't take very long. Surprise number two is that the process activates whole islands of other genetic responses. The dogs look different, they sound different. Uh, absolutely fascinating book. Had to have it in here, uh, especially since I think it speaks directly to the subject of a, uh, a subject that comes up in natural history books. At least once a year there's a new book on the subject of where dogs come from, how they come about. Uh, there are articles in journals and scientific or National Geographic and, and there are new books and here is the process itself, uh, or a variation of it, uh, that is just happening in real time and is absolutely fantastic to, to read about. Uh, and the next one uh, is a big soft spot of mine. I was very happy to find a nice, pretty hardcover of it. It's the favorite book of diaries. Uh, this is It's just a collection throughout the ages. You, you, probably, you might remember, those of you who've seen my 1,565 previous videos, there's a, there's a book on the shelf behind me called The Assassin's Cloak, which is a gigantic compilation of journals and diary entries over the centuries, and this is the same thing. It's a smaller book, uh, but I love the choices. They're not the same, uh, and I, I just love them. I love reading through books like that. Uh, I confess to a, a bit of a sentimental weakness that sometimes I'll pick one off the shelf and just find today's date and read all the different entries, what was going on, but sometimes, a lot of times, I just get caught up in reading the, these little glimpses into people's lives who are long gone. Uh, their times, sometimes even their countries, long gone. Uh, it reminds me uh, that I need to do a video on keeping a journal. I, I will I will get to that. I will do that this week. And then we'll start with the, the normal books, the books on the normal shelf. We'll start with an old friend of mine. <laughs> he's, uh, he's not mentioned anywhere else on BookTube, but, but I'm going to mention him. This is the Venerable Bede, and this is the Illustrated Bede. Uh, uh, lovely. Uh, it gives you uh, bead, but it, it also fills, let me see if I can find, yeah, it fills the whole thing with pictures of the places that he describes in full color, which is amazingly uh, effective. <laughs> uh, if he'd have been able to afford it, I'm sure he would have loved the idea himself. Uh, and then we go on to uh, a Viking book. It won't be the last Viking book on the shelf. Uh, this is the Oxford Illustrated History of the Vikings. Uh, these Oxford Illustrated Histories. I don't know if Oxford makes them anymore, but they are so good. They are it's, it's historical writing, but it's they're bigger and lavishly illustrated, so you get to see the subject. And they make them for everything. I have quite a few of them. Uh, and they're just fantastic to consult. Uh, and the next one is a gigantic history. This is uh, Homosexuality and Civilization. Uh, the author is Louis Crompton, and I don't know if this is a translation or not. This was from Harvard University Press uh, back in 2003, uh, when I was not back in the reviewing game, or I would have been all over this. I, uh, it's, it's comprehensive, it's narrative in a stodgy kind of way, and I don't agree, of course, before you get to the, really, to the 17th or 18th century, you have to do a lot of creative jiggering and finessing with your material uh, in order to create a, st a straightforward narrative. Uh, and it does that, but it, it's, a, it's a very good book. I go, to, I go back to it. Uh, the next one is a bit of a sentimental favorite for a very odd reason. <laughs> this is In the Presence of the Creator. Uh, this is Gail Christensen's fantastic biography of, of Isaac Newton. I think the best biography of Isaac Newton that's ever been written for its readability, in addition to everything else. I mean, you want 
a biographer of Newton to be conversant with science. You want that biographer to be able to somehow convey to you the deep, abstruse scientific waters in which Newton's mind was forever voyaging. <laughs> uh, you, if you don't have a biographer who can do that, then then you're stuck. Uh, but you also want somebody who writes really well, and this is this this author fills the bill. And the reason that it's sentimental is because. Uh, I, I got it eons ago from the least likely source in the world. It was a gift from my mother, <laughs> from the sainted Ma, who uh, came to me one year and said, you like reading, don't you? You're going to wear out your eyes. And I said, yes, Ma, I do like reading, and I'm not worried about wearing out my eyes. And she said, well, I'll let me get you a book. What do you want? Which I don't hear that often. As I've complained on this channel before. Most people buy first and never ask later. <laughs> uh, and that's the one I picked. At the time, I belonged to the History Book Club. And it was their featured title, and I grabbed it. Uh, and, I, I, and I loved it. That was icing on the cake, because it was a really good book. Uh, and then the next one is an, another great biography, something we've seen on this channel before. This is Francis Hackett's biography of Henry VIII. That is just fantastic. Oh, man. It's just fantastic. Uh, Hackett wrote it almost a hundred years ago, and it's still, it still has the power to move me everywhere, uh, all along its length, on every subject. Uh, but I, since I've got it here, and since I've got it open, I thought I'd read the part that I really love, my favorite part of it, because it's been, what, a year and 600 videos since I last read it. Uh, one of the great strengths of the book is that Hackett is great not only on his own main subject, Henry, and not only on the Tudors, but also on everybody else in the era, including the Dutch humanist Erasmus, who I've read everything there is to, to read about in every language, and I've read every word that he's ever written, which is no small feat since he spent his lifetime writing. Uh, I've read every biography, and yet, as I've said before on many occasions in person and on this channel, I've never read a summary of him that does him justice better than these, these, these two paragraphs from Hackett. So I, you're, if you indulge me, I'll read them. Uh, it's about the death of Erasmus. Uh, meanwhile, rational Europe, trying to keep inflammable passion and mad peasant blood within decent bounds, had lost its great spokesman in Erasmus. He died in April. The torch of good reason was for the moment dimmed. Two firebrands, still obscure, were planning the conquest of mankind for a Christ of their own making. Each asking his followers to immolate their reason and to bind their will. In 1536, John Calvin published his Institutio. In the same year, a Spanish Basque, to be known as Ignatius Loyola, was finishing the studies at Paris that underlay the Society of Jesus. Henry's moderation on the terms of his own dominance would push half-evolved Europeans along the road to the modern state, while Calvin and Loyola, borrowing statecraft and rousing the lust of warfare with the breath of the eternal, would stir in religion precisely the same appetite for earthly dominance. Beside them, Erasmus might seem a feeble creature, sitting by his open fire with a glass of burgundy in front of him. But Erasmus had made the New Testament his labor of love. He was not a hero like Loyola or Calvin. He was not an emperor, as Henry now called himself. He was only a humanist. But beside him, the Jesuits affirming liberty and vowing obedience, or the Calvinists affirming predestination and applying the scourge, recalled very ancient priesthoods and glorious savage instincts that cry out from the caverns to be released even if they must carry a Bible in their hand. Yet the Galilean Jew could not have despised the humanist. If he had rested by the fire with Erasmus, this book of the New Testament on his knees and a glass of burgundy before him, Perhaps he might have raised those sad eyes to see that truth and charity had lingered for an instant at Basel, finding an honest welcome there, and that the word was still alive, and that the arm of the law and the methods of torture to which his own thin hands bore witness were perhaps not the only ways to prize the divinity in man. The whole book is that good. I, I can't recommend it enough the next time you find it rotting away at a yard sale by somebody who has no idea that it's any good. <laughs> Uh, and the next one is a book that we've uh, mentioned on this channel before. It's uh, it's Les Mortes Tour by Sir Thomas Mallory. This is in the Everyman's uh, the Everyman edition, which had on its cover uh, an ugly, out of focus, blurry, bo poorly colored cut detail from some tapestry somewhere. And I thought, okay, I really like the 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 paperback edition here, but I hate the cover. 
And this is an example of what I was talking about the other day, that when I hate the cover, I sometimes will make a new one for myself. And that's what I did with this one. Still Le Morte Tour, but I found a picture of King Richard III uh, and just put him on the cover. I framed it. I made the color right so that you wouldn't, you, at first glance, you wouldn't be able to tell. But it's a better cover <laughs> than, than the one I found. Uh, uh, and then we move on to modern history, to, to recent history. This is the Holocaust on trial. This is, uh, who's the author of this? D.D. Goodopan did a, this is a great, the best one that I've read so far, uh, account of the trial of David Irving, the notorious British historian who sued the American historian Deborah Lipstadt uh, when she called him a Holocaust denier. And he sued her in London, so it was up to her to prove that he was. And there was a gigantic media circus of a trial in which Irving added to the circus atmosphere by deciding to represent himself in court. Uh, and it's an absolutely fascinating story. It was recently made into a brainless movie. <sighs> the less said, the better. Uh, and but, it, but it's also had its share of books. And someday, I don't know, it couldn't happen. We live in a witch hunt era. In an ideal world, I would love to write an account of David Irving just in general, and the showcase would be that trial. It was so important to the rest of us. Uh, his story is so important to the rest of us, to literature and to literary freedom, uh, that it, it's all the more poignant that the man himself can be so unpleasant and that some of the things he writes can be so revolting. It, it would be easier if he were nicer. And if the right and the wrong of it were easier to see and for everybody to agree on, the fact that these issues of what you're free to say, what you're free to write, how people will analyze your arguments are coming about revolving around a guy who says that Hitler mostly protected the Jews it just adds to the, the piquancy of it. I just, I, well, I, that book, History on Trial, is really good. It's the best one on the subject so far. Uh, and then the next one, <laughs> the next one is an anthology uh, of of uh, nonfiction writing about writing. This is it was part of a series I think made for schools. The best writing on writing. This is volume two. I don't have volume one. I don't know if there are any other volumes. And the reason that I have this one, there's lots of good writing in here. Uh, the, Joyce Carol Oates, for instance, has a wonderful essay in here about J C O and me, her literary persona versus herself. That's just just fantastic. But the reason that I have this, <laughs> the reason that I kept it for the Adrenaline Rush, is a piece called Dear Reviewer by David Carkey that he did for the San Francisco Review of Books a while ago, which is just, uh, it, it takes the form of a memo that he dashes off to all the reviewers, the book reviewers out there, and it's infuriating. It is, it is a two-page distillation of the entitlement of authors summarized better than any satirist could do it. Uh, and the, some of the final points are, uh, don't compare the book to anything. Don't compare it to another book. Don't compare it to a movie. Don't compare it to a meal. Or another point, uh, don't write a penultimate paragraph qualifying everything you've said, followed by a last paragraph that begins with still and reaffirms everything you've just qualified. And then there's another point, don't stand out in any way. Stand back where you belong. No, further back, further still, Further, there. And then there's the last point. When you finish your review, send a copy to the author right away. Ask for comments so that you might improve your craft. And once upon a time, uh, the, the urchins of my day would have said, your mother wears army boots. You see, it's already got my artificial rhesus monkey heart going. <laughs> uh, then, as as I threatened, we're back to Vikings. <laughs> so this is a wonderful old book, The Viking Achievement. I had to I had to pen in the uh, the title because this thing was fading. It, I got a hardcover that was fading. I got it at the Brattle, and I now keep hoping that I will find one with a nice bright dust jacket instead of the fading one. And I know that I will. <laughs> I know that I will find it. The Brattle will provide. Uh, but this is. Uh, it's a history of the Vikings, which, I, I, as you can tell, I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, but it's also, the, I like the, the tack that it takes, which is that the Vikings weren't just about destruction and pillaging and, and theft and whatnot. They, they also did a lot. They, they also did a lot to, to seed the ground of Western civilization. I like that. Uh, and the next one's also a Viking book, a wonderful work of scholarship. This is The Norseman in the Viking Age by Eric Christensen. Uh, 
which is this, essentially the same thing. It's a, it's a history of the Viking era. But Christensen is so good. He's clearly, he's, he's an absolutely breathtaking scholar in terms of his, his material. But he's clearly also having a ball while he writes it. I think about a book like this when I think about people who say, oh, I don't want to read history. Ah, oh, come on, I'm out of school now. Do I have to read history? I think about books like this and I think you just don't know what you're missing. That's all. You, this is the only way to put it. You don't know what you're missing. Uh, and then, and talk about you don't know what you're missing. Oh my God. An author, the next one is an author that everybody would just dismiss. Almost everybody, probably everybody on BookTube with only a handful of people. And yet, he has the soul of delight to make his acquaintances, to make the acquaintance of someone you will know the rest of your life as though you knew a living person. I'm, of course, referring to Samuel Pepys. <laughs> this is the shorter Pepys. See, still a huge book. He kept a diary uh, for 10 years and only reluctantly gave it up uh, when he thought that his eyesight was fading and he thought, I need my eyesight, so I will give up this diary. And he wrote, and in one of his last entries he wrote, that it's like seeing my own body go into the grave. And he kept it in a completely unselfconscious way. Plenty of people in his time, diary writing was starting to become vogue, and a little later would become de rigueur. But plenty of people in his time kept diaries, but Pepys' diary is like none of them. It's honestly like he doesn't know that he's writing. Oh, like there's any chance that anyone could come along later and read what he writes. So it's a naked glimpse into his mind, including his subconscious, where he'll write something horrible that he himself has done, and then he'll write how horrible he feels about it, and then he'll detail the steps he took to hide it from people, and there it is on the page, <laughs> reading about it 500 years later. <laughs> it, it's fun and amazing, and you, you pull your hair out at some of the dumb things he does, but you also love his generosity and his humor and his constant decision over and over again. To make the best of life, to be happy, to try and improve himself. It's just, ugh. I, uh, I don't at the moment have the longer Peeps. I don't have right now the unabridged diary of Samuel Peeps. I, I keep meaning to, they show up, there's a beautiful set, oh my god, it's, it's all white trade paperbacks, just year by year with huge notes, and I see them from time to time at the Brattle, and I keep meaning to get them all and just have a whole shelf, but uh, in the meantime, uh, there are several great shorter versions of Peeps, and I know it's it's probably wasted, but you don't have to take a Megillah book like this. Modern Library, for instance, our Everyman's Library, both of their shorter versions of Peeps are actually very short. They'll give you a good glimpse of what he's like, and also you don't need to spend money at all. There are websites that are the Daily Peeps, where they do exactly what I just described for that diary book. They take you, they give you Peeps' entry for that day, for whatever day you are. Complete with notes. You might want to give it a try. That's all. That's all I'm saying. And the last book for this shelf, the fifth bookshelf of the tall uh, West Wall bookcase, is something we've seen on this channel many times before. I've, I I love it to death. And it is the Book of Merlin by T. H. White. Originally, uh, originally planned to be the uh, the final chapter of his great work, The Once and Future King, uh, but published as a standalone thing on its own, and it's, it's, it's just beautiful. It's incredibly sad and beautiful. Uh, the story of a very old and emotionally dejected King Arthur thinks that his whole life has been wasted, and he's, he's plucked out of reality for one last long theoretical discussion with his great teacher Merlin and with a handful of animals, discussing the worth of mankind, uh, or lack thereof. <laughs> and it's much as I love The Once and Future King, and I do, I absolutely do, I love it. Uh, I think it's the greatest work of fantasy in the 20th century. I, the Book of Merlin has a special place for me. Uh, and uh, I'm, so we'll end on that. We'll end on, on uh, a fantastic note. And uh, next, we're, we're still not done with this book. <laughs> so next time we'll move on. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll see you later. Thank you, Booktube.